It's a story so rich in intrigue that if it were fiction, it would likely be a bestseller because all of the dead, almost two dozen to date, worked in Western Europe's defense industry. And the deaths, some bizarre by any standards, have been scattered across the continent. Only by chance did the pattern emerge. But the question is obvious. Is this all just coincidence, or has international espionage produced a string of murders? Well, Stone Phillips went to Europe to investigate, and here's what he found out. The mystery begins here in picturesque Bristol, England. In August 1986, Vimal Dajubai, a 24-year-old computer scientist, drove his car to this 200-foot-high suspension bridge. He walked out along the edge. Then he jumped to his death. Or was he pushed? Dajubai had left no suicide note. When his body was recovered, initial police reports noted a strange puncture mark on his thigh. But the case passed virtually unnoticed. Then one night about a month later, on this hill overlooking Bristol, Another young computer scientist, Ashad Sharif, working for the same company, tied a rope around a tree, wrapped the other end around his neck, then got back into his car and pushed the accelerator to the floor. Dajabai and Sharif were both working for Marconi, one of Britain's top defense contractors, and in less than a month's time, both had died unnatural deaths. This time, somebody noticed. I was given what I thought at the time was accurate information, but which later turned out to be uh, totally false. Tony Collins, a reporter with a trade publication called Computer News, started digging after receiving a tip. He discovered that one of the dead men worked on a highly secret project called Cosmos, doing underwater torpedo research that also had applications to America's Star Wars program. Then Collins found that by merely knowing about the Cosmos project, Marconi felt he knew too much. The more inquiries I made about it, it seemed that uh, the more upset Marconi became. And they wanted to know exactly what information we'd obtained, and they said that there'd been an internal inquiry which had established that we'd been given information which could be harmful to the national interest. But the warning didn't work. Headlined mystery deaths, Tony Collins' story hit the newsstands here in London in March 1987 and set off an avalanche of stories and speculation in every major newspaper in Great Britain. As reporters began digging, they discovered what seemed to be a pattern of unusual and often bizarre deaths of scientists, engineers, and computer experts in the defense industry. The prestigious London Sunday Times documented a total of 22 mysterious deaths and disappearances. One of the earliest and most puzzling was the 1982 death of Professor Keith Bowden, a brilliant computer scientist who did secret work for the Ministry of Defense. His death has always seemed suspicious to his family. This was not an accidental death. There is, I feel, some form of conspiracy by somebody. Whether it is one side or the other side, I know not. The purpose of it, I know not. As this reenactment suggests, Bowden was driving home from a dinner party when his new rover slammed into a ditch. The road was clear, and friends say Bowden had not been drinking. Discrepancies in the police report led Bowden's widow to hire a private investigator, who told her that the tires on her husband's new car had been changed. These are the tires. Someone had replaced them with old and dangerous tires. These are not the tires that would have been on the rover. They're a different sort of tire, and you can see how badly worn they are. They're smooth, and here they're worn right down to the fabric. That's worn the... completely through the tread? Completely through. And this wear could not have happened from the accident, from the burning no. of the tire? No, no, no. You believe this was not an accident? No, that wasn't an accident. <clears throat> Got me an accident with those things on his car, didn't it? Since 1982, four other British defense scientists have been killed in unexplained car crashes. He never talked about anything at all. In this quiet English garden, yet another macabre death. This was his, uh, his tool shed, his garden That's shed. Right. It's in a bit of a mess at the moment. Mary Beckham found her husband, Alistair, electrocuted in his garden shed. This is where you found the body. That's right. Beckham was a happily married man with three beautiful daughters and had worked for years for a large defense contractor called Plessy Naval Systems. He was an engineer, but in 17 years of marriage, he never told his wife exactly what kind of work he did. Mrs. Beckham finds it impossible to believe that he would walk into this shed after pruning the trees, wrap bare wire around his arm, and flick on the 220-volt current. He had pinned a fuse with a paper clip 
and had a, a handkerchief stuffed into his mouth. It was horrible. When we couldn't open the shed door, one of my twin daughters looked in through the keyhole and she said, Mommy, Daddy is lying in there. I see him. And then I, I had a look and I could see his feet sort of on top of this. Just a few hours after his death, as in other cases we were told about, men showed up to remove confidential defense documents from his home. See, Mrs. Closed. Beckham also wonders why her husband installed this wide-angle peephole. It's rather strange to have a peephole in a, yes. in a garden shed door. Yes. Well, I'm afraid I can't tell you mm -hmm. why, it's, why it's there. He must have had a reason for having it there. As more and more strange deaths of defense researchers came to light, the British press abounded with speculation and theories. Was a foreign power involved? Some observed that it wasn't hard to figure out who would benefit if important NATO research was slowed down. But hard evidence to support any kind of a connection just wasn't there, and the British government insisted it was all just a coincidence. But at least one opposition member of parliament isn't satisfied. I think the government should look into it and tell us more about it. And I want to know why, in many cases, the police at first appeared to be doing an investigation and then called it off and said, no, there's nothing else to investigate. Are you seriously concerned that something, I'm something sinister may be at work? Yes, here? I am concerned that something sinister is at work. It's when you press me beyond that to say, well, what are the sinister forces coming from that I'm not able to answer you? Bombings and assassinations in Europe directed at NATO research targets have added to the speculation that something sinister is going on. In Germany in 1986, the research director at Siemens Electronics, a large company doing SDI, or Star Wars research, was killed by a terrorist bomb. Later, there were bombings at two more German laboratories doing SDI work. These three attacks had the main target, the same target, uh, it was the defense industry all involved more or less in SDI, for example, and in other highly sophisticated technology. And in Sweden, an underwater defense expert, like the two men in Bristol, disappeared along with all the testing equipment in his boat. Svani Odin's death was kept quiet by the Swedish authorities until the press found out. And if the events themselves seem strange, just take a look at the timing. The German and Swedish incidents and the death at the Bristol Bridge all happen within just 30 days of one another. What does American intelligence say about all of this? The CIA, as usual, refuses to comment. But we did talk to a respected intelligence expert in Washington, Ray Klein, who's been an advisor to seven presidents. The intelligence analysts have to study the probabilities. I would say the probability is that in most of the cases that have been reviewed, there is a hostile purpose by a, an enemy intelligence service which has either controlled or has suggested to uh, maybe irresponsible people that it would be wise for them to attack a specific enemy and that those enemies are the high-tech defense research community. One very senior member of that high-tech defense research community was John Ferry, another Marconi employee. Ferry's widow says he flew to NATO headquarters in Brussels every two weeks to chair an important NATO research committee. And a few years ago, he was the British military's top research and development man in Washington. Of all the deaths we examined, his was probably the most gruesome. I mean, did you know the way in which he killed himself? And he, he actually took two electrodes and taped them. He had some black sticky tape to his, to his molars where he'd got fillings in his teeth, stoppings. That so was metal on metal like that. I mean, it was an extraordinary thing to do. It, it's horrible. But even though Mrs. Ferry finds the way her husband died extremely bizarre, of all the widows we talked to, she was the least suspicious. She told us that one month before his death, John Ferry and his daughter were driving down a country road when a truck swerved directly at them. Although no one was seriously injured, Ferry seemed to suffer a complete mental breakdown. Mrs. Ferry contends that if you look closely at any large industry, you'd find a comparable suicide rate. But a suicide expert we talked to says there's something unusual here. A number of these deaths do not appear to fit the pattern that you would expect uh, from people of this background. 
meaning no suicide note? No suicide note. Um, uh, some of the deaths, and in two in particular, are very, very bizarre. Absent any severe mental disorder, any mental illness, how do you explain such bizarre methods? Well, I can't, other than perhaps to quote dear old Hamlet when he says, methinks there's something rotten in the state of Denmark. Last year, another defense scientist died here in the seaside village of Lytham in northern England. John Whiteman, a computer expert at British Aerospace, had been working on a new fighter aircraft being developed by Britain, Germany, and Italy. He was found drowned in his bathtub, empty bottles of whiskey and sleeping pills at his side. And yet, curiously, no pills and only a fraction of that alcohol were found in his system. The death here in Litham, like the others, seemed hard to explain. The local coroner was unable to determine the cause of death. The verdict, once again, left open. But this case focused not so much on questions of foul play, but on another problem facing the defense industry, a problem no less insidious. A lot of these men seem to have been suffering from stress. And I think stress is a problem in the defense industry. And it seems to be a problem that isn't recognized by um, the companies concerned. Mrs. Whiteman says her husband was stressed out and anxious over an impossible assignment that his bosses refused to release him from, a claim the company denies. Although she's puzzled by his death and the unexplained pill and whiskey bottles, absent any evidence of foul play, job-related stress is the only explanation she can come up with. It was only when he was asked to do something that he felt was impossible, and I think he was he was put under the stress by his superiors. When we contacted British Aerospace about the Whiteman death, we were told that stress is a personal problem, one the company can do nothing about, and that any further comment on this case would violate the Official Secrets Act. Journalist Tony Collins points out that stress cannot explain all of the deaths. He cites the case of Peter People, who did secret research at the Royal Military College. Two years ago, after an enjoyable evening playing Trivial Pursuit with friends, his wife found him dead beneath his car in the locked garage. The engine was running, his head directly under the exhaust. But police said it was impossible to get into that position with the garage door closed. Why he would kill himself is absolutely baffling. I don't think you can, you can say that stress is a contributory factor in all the cases. Obviously, stress must play a part in some of them. Um, but um, I don't think any of these cases lend themselves to a single easy explanation. Some critics say the British government's refusal to launch an official investigation is just one more example of a growing obsession with secrecy, especially in matters of defense and intelligence. Even if there was nothing untoward, nothing suspicious about it, surely this country should be concerned that some of its top scientists and computer experts engaged in top defense contracts have lost their lives. I would have thought that would concern any government anywhere throughout the world. But so far, demands for an inquiry have been falling on deaf ears. And it appears the widows could be left with a maze of troubling questions, along with their grief. Is the string of deaths only a coincidence, a series of unconnected accidents, misadventures, and suicides, as the British government insists? Or is there more to it? Is the government holding back information in the name of national security? Is the high-tech, high-pressure world of defense research pushing scientists over the brink? Has espionage played a role in any of these deaths? Many of the victims' families say they don't know who or what to believe and fear that in the end, their need for answers will always lose out to the tight-lipped secrecy of the defense world. What do you think happened? I, I don't know what happened. I wish I knew. Do you think your husband committed suicide? No. No, no, I don't. No. Do you think you'll ever know what happened? I doubt it. I hope I will, but I, I have... I don't believe I ever will. Stone, what's the reaction of the U.S. Embassy to all of this? Uh, Hugh, a spokesman there told me that they've been following the press reports, uh, passing them on to Washington, but beyond that, they don't know anything more about this story than we do. But they're inclined to believe the British government's position that this is just a coincidence.
You know, what about the British public and their attitude? Are they getting annoyed with all the official secrecy? Well, uh, somewhat annoyed, somewhat suspicious, I think. People we talked to uh, told us they felt the government just isn't telling all it knows about this uh, subject. In fact, the Thatcher government has recently proposed legislation in Parliament that would strengthen the Official Secrets Act, which in this country would already be considered unconstitutional. So that adds to the puzzlement of this whole case. Yeah. Thank you, Stone. Later, would you call our court system a prison of tears? This family would. They're not on trial, but John Stossel shows us why they feel they are. Pain without end. And next, many of our smartest high school seniors are Asian Americans. Lynn Scher asks, have they become victims of their own success?